Hello there, my friends. Welcome to the midweek meditation for the week of June 30th, 2021. I want to welcome all of you to the worship channel of the First Presbyterian Church of Coal Valley and the Beulah Presbyterian Church of Orion. As you know, we are reaching the completion of our study about the patriarchs of our faith. Today, we are near the death of the patriarch Jacob and he finishes the task that he had to do. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Living Lord of love and truth, we humbly come before you this day and give you thanks and praise for the wonderful blessing of your love. Guide our footsteps that we might know your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we share from Genesis 49, and I won't read all of the verses of this chapter, so you will uh, want to read the whole chapter in preparation for this lesson. Genesis 49, hear the word of the Lord. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so that I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble. And listen, sons of Jacob, listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Simon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob, and disperse them in Israel. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down, like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash away his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. His bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the land of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because your father's God who helps you because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heavens above, blessings of the deep that lies below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your Father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, in the evening he divides the plunder. All these are
are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. And then he gave them these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite, along with the field. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittite. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up onto the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Here ends this blessed reading that comes from the book of Genesis. Let's bow in prayer. Dear God, shine a light on our path that we might know your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may remember from last week's meditation that I said Jacob had one more task to complete before his passing. Chapter 49 tells us of this task, and it was to bless his sons, to prophesy about where they would land in the history of Israel. Verse 1 says he calls all his sons together. He says, gather round so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. And in this passage, Jacob is not just taking a guess about what will happen to each of his sons. He knows. He's not just telling them what his wish is for each of his sons. He is speaking here in this passage with authority from God, proceeding through his dying words. Indeed, Jacob, at least in this passage, is speaking with a prophetic voice. That is, speaking through God, speaking through the voice of Jacob to predict what will become of each of the sons of Israel, of each of the tribes of Israel. He first speaks to his eldest son, Reuben, and he acknowledges that Reuben is indeed his firstborn. Jacob says that Reuben was the first sign of his strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. But because Reuben was greedy about his birthright, he tried to use a pagan ritual to claim that birthright for himself, rather than that birthright being bestowed upon him by God. He had defiled his God-given gift. And he would not receive it because of that. Next, Jacob deals with his sons, Simon and Levi. Jacob says to them that their swords are weapons of violence. And so Jacob says, let me not enter into their counsel. Jacob here is referring way back to an instance where the family, the entire of Jacob's family, is staying at Shechem. And Dinah, Jacob's daughter, was defiled by the leader of Shechem. And that aroused a sense of anger within the hearts of Dinah's brothers, Levi and Simeon. You may recall from the details of our study Levi and Shechem convinced all of the Shechemites to be circumcised and they said it was in order to pacify the God of Jacob for the wrong that had been perpetrated on their sister Dinah. And so just at the time when all of the male Shechemites were suffering the most from their circumcisions, Levi and Simeon 
led a vicious attack on the city of Shechem. They slaughtered all the males that were suffering from their circumcisions in order to exact revenge upon those who defiled their sister Dinah. So according, so according to Jacob's prophetic voice, at this time, close to his death, God has not forgotten, forgotten the cruelty within the hearts of Levi and Simeon. The descendants of Simeon would be scattered and eventually would disappear because they were just assimilated into the tribe of Judah. The Levites fared a little better and they redeemed themselves by becoming a nation of priests. Instead of a tribal allotment of land, they were given cities around the kingdom. And eventually, Moses and Aaron came from amongst the Levites. Jacob then deals with Judah. Interestingly enough, you may remember Judah was the one who first left his father's family's care and went to live with the pagans. And in the process, he ended up getting into his own sort of trouble with Tamar. And I won't go into the details of that. But years later, Judah redeemed himself by taking a leadership role in the time of the famine, by convincing Jacob about what was going on with the famine and leading his brothers. Jacob's prophecy about Judah, though, really had everything to do with predicting that the line of David and eventually the line of the Messiah would come from the sons of Judah. Jacob says of Judah, your brothers will praise you and your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor ruler's staff from between his feet. These and a lot of other things that are said of Judah by Jacob point to the seed from which the Messiah would come. One by one after that, Jacob prophesies about the direction of each of his son's lives, where they would go and what they would end up doing and the role that they would play in God's kingdom. And in fact, the truth is that history shows that each of these prophecies that came from the mouth of Jacob on that day were exactly correct. And if you think about it, this is truly amazing, as is any accurate prophecy, I guess. This was 600 years before the line and kingship of David that would eventually be the line of the Messiah. The other significant part of Jacob's prophecy about is about Joseph. We talked within the last couple weeks how Joseph was not given a tribal allotment of land, but rather one share of Joseph's or of Jacob's inheritance was given to each of Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. You might remember from our last lesson, Jacob intentionally crossed over his arms and went against the tradition of the firstborn receiving the choice blessing. Jacob intentionally told Joseph he knew what he was doing. And he told Joseph that Manasseh would have a great nation to proceed from him. But Ephraim was ordained to receive the blessing of the firstborn. Even though he was not the firstborn, it was God's will. And in fact, down the road, when King Rehoboam made the decision that there would be two kingdoms, the southern and the northern kingdoms, the southern kingdom was called Judah and later Judea, and the northern kingdom was often referred to as Ephraim, 
the primary tribe in that northern kingdom. So indeed, the prophecy came true. Ephraim became more significant than Manasseh. Now, I want to take a step outside the passage today and explain a little bit about this foundation of Scripture because it helps you interpret future prophecies from Isaiah and other prophecies. At first, Israel was one nation, the land that had been Canaan, the same land promised to Abraham so many generations ago. And under Saul and David and Solomon, Israel was one nation. Then Rehoboam came along and divided the kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms, the north and the south, as I've said. The south was named Judah or Judea, and its capital was Jerusalem, as we know it is today. The north was called Israel or Ephraim, and its capital was Samaria. And again, we can see these roots evolving even in today. And just like God said through Jacob so many generations before, Ephraim would be greater than Manasseh. Another thing that's interesting for you to know about the history of Israel is this. After the northern kingdom split away from the south and they had their own kingdom, they were the first ones to fall in the fall of Israel. The Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom and they deported most of the population of the more northern kingdom to a different land, although a few stayed. And then the Assyrians brought a new population, a pagan population, to dwell in the land of the northern kingdom. And they intermixed with the northern kingdom residents that were still there. And so their bloodline became very mixed and very impure. And so eventually, the north basically lost its identity. They lost the purity of their bloodline as Jews that came from the patriarchs. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The people in the southern kingdom were pretty much deported all as a nation to the same place. And their nation, the land of their nation, was destroyed and almost uninhabited until their nation returned and they rebuilt. Their population was basically intact a, a generation or two later when they came back and restored the kingdom. Their bloodline as the chosen people was basically intact. Eventually the people in the north were no longer called people of Ephraim. They were simply known as Samaritans. But in the eyes of the Jews of the southern kingdom, they were no longer children of Abraham. They were no longer God's chosen. They were half-breeds or even worse. And by the time of Jesus coming, the people in the northern part of the kingdom were called Samaritans. And because of the impurity of their family line, by Jesus' time, the Samaritans were simply despised by the Jews. That's, and that's well documented in the New Testament. So, upon the completion of Jacob's prophecy, prophecy, there's an airplane right over my head, naturally, during this. So, upon the completion of his prophecy, prophecy that Jacob proclaimed in Isaiah 49, or not Isaiah 49, Genesis 49, God has a purpose for Jacob in this world and it's now complete. So the last part of Genesis 49 tells us about Jacob's death. Jacob gives his son final instructions about his burial. He says, I am about to be gathered to my people. And that, of course, means that he was about to die. He tells them to bury him with Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah and Leah. The site where all of these patriarch people are buried in Canaan, near Hebron. 
So after giving these instructions to his sons, the instructions about his burial, the scripture says he drew his feet up onto the bed and he breathed his last breath. And he was gathered to his people. And it's apparent that his sons were true to Jacob's final wishes as to where he would be buried. Because that's where he's buried, near Hebron, in the cave that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. And you can go there and visit these tombs today. Abraham and his family are right, south, right outside of Hebron. But the one patriarch that you won't find there is Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife. Remember, she is buried in Bethlehem, marking a tragic day in Jacob's life because he loved Rachel so much. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your love. May your goodness and mercy be a part of our hearts. May the wisdom of these Old Testament scripture passages truly feed our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.